Hi class, let's continue our discussion with energy in the cells. Most of the energy that we have in our cells is going to be stored um, in the form of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, that's very special nucleic acid that's super high energy. Now this energy is going to be also, or this ATP is also known as the energy currency of the cell. We can use ATP as transferable energy, it can transfer energy from one chemical reaction to another chemical reaction. And this ATP, this transferable energy, allows us to make or break chemical bonds that normally would be energetically unfavorable, that normally would not occur unless we had an input of energy. If we look at our chemical reactions based off of the energy use, an exergonic chemical reaction is going to release chemical energy. It's going to have a net release of energy. So if we go through exergonic chemical reactions, the energy is going to be released from the molecules when we break those bonds, and that energy can be stored in ATP. Endergonic chemical reactions, generally speaking, have a net input or require an addition of energy. So endergonic chemical reactions are going to use up ATP generally speaking. Both of these ender, exer and endergogic chemical reactions are coupled with either ATP production or ATP use so that we can immediately take the energy that's been harvested from one chemical reaction and use it up in another chemical reaction. Generally speaking, our exergonic chemical reactions are going to be catabolic chemical reactions and endergonic chemical reactions are going to be anabolic in nature. So these exergonic chemical reactions usually occur when we take a larger molecule and break it down into smaller molecules. And these endergonic chemical reactions usually occur when we take smaller molecules and connect them to make bigger molecules. Our cells are going to have very specialized enzymes in them that can trap the energy in the bonds of our nutrients as we break down molecules. These specialized energy trapping molecules are going to be released during exergonic chemical reactions and store that energy in the terminal phosphate bond of ATP that's between the second and the third phosphate. So in the, between those high energy phosphate bonds. Our ATP will temporarily store energy in that high energy phosphate bond and then release that energy later at a different chemical reaction to fuel those endergonic reactions as we make bigger molecules. As we're adding or losing electrons to the cells, we have some terms that cover that. Oxidation is formally known as the loss of electrons, and reduction is the gain of electrons. The mnemonic was oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain, oil rig. So as we lose electrons from a molecule, it's been oxidized. As we gain electrons on the molecule, we reduce the molecule. We make that become lower in charge. We reduce the overall charge. An ox-redox reaction or redox reactions are going to be common in our cell because we're commonly taking electrons from one molecule and shoving them to another molecule back and forth. These ox oxidation reduction or redox reactions are essential for keeping our cells alive, to keep those microorganisms living. The chemical, the enzymes that catalyze oxidation reduction reactions or oxoreductases are specialized on shuttling electrons around from one molecule to another molecule. Many of these oxoreductases are going to require a coenzyme or aka a vitamin. And these coenzymes will carry those high energy electrons from one molecule to another molecule. Two very common coenzyme electron carriers that occur in bacterial cells are NAD and FAD. If we look at these um, molecules that can donate electrons and then the molecule that will accept the electrons, we know they pair up with each other and form an oxidation reduction pair or a redox pair. One is the electron donor, one is going to be the electron acceptor. If it donates the electron, it's going to be a oxidizer. If it accepts the electron, it's going to be the reducer in the, the pairing. So here's a classic example. We have sodium and we have chlorine. Sodium has one outer valence electron, and then chlorine has an outer octet of valence electrons that's missing one electron. So we are one electron away from a stable valence of eight. Sodium has one excess electron that it needs to lose until it gets to that stable valence shell of eight electrons. So sodium will lose an electron and donate it to chlorine, sodium is going to be 
oxidized, chlorine is going to be reduced, and then they both have stable valence, outer valence shells of eight valence electrons. In this process of shaking one charged electron and moving it to another molecule, another atom, will change the overall charges of our atoms, and if these were larger molecules, we would change the overall charge of the molecule. Oxidation reduction can occur when we have the electron acceptor capture um, those electrons. Another term for this is going to be phosphorylation. If we take a phosphate group from an ATP and attach it to the molecule, we will make that ATP, the adenosine triphosphate, into an ADP, an adenosine diphosphate. So we'll take that high energy chemical bond from the ATP and use it to attach a phosphate group to the target molecule. And this is a way of energizing it. Whenever we attach phosphate groups to the molecule to energize the molecule, we call that phosphorylation or to phosphorylate something. Our cell doesn't going to handle electrons directly as individual electrons. Individual electrons are too hot to handle. Um, they are too reactive and can form too much damage to the cell. Instead, we're going to handle those electrons as components of a hydrogen atom. And those components will exist of a single electron um, being bound to a molecule or a single proton being bound to the molecule. We'll never have an individual electron being moved from one part of the cell to another part of the cell all by itself. It's never going to make it. It'll, it will be bound up in some side chemical reaction. During a ox redox reaction, if we remove a hydrogen atom, we refer to that as a dehydrogenation reaction. So a dehydrogenase is going to remove hydrogen atoms from the substrate. Let's look at some figures to show you some examples. If we take nicotinamide, or NAD, and we combine it with some electrons to reduce it, we'll make it into NADH. The oxidized NAD is this whole molecule right here. We have the adenine, we have some ribose sugars, and then we have that nicotine group. And if we add some electrons and some hydrogen ions to it, that nicotinamide will be reduced and we'll have a new chemical bond form right here. And it'll go from NAD positive to NADH. Over here, this has a net positive charge, and then this guy is going to have a net neutral charge. So what I want you to take out of this figure is we don't move individual electrons and, pro and protons around in the cell. Instead, we attach them to larger carrier molecules. So let's talk some more about adenosine triphosphate. That adenosine triphosphate is often referred to as the energy currency of the cell. Sometimes it's referred to as metabolic money. Our adenosine triphosphate has three primary parts. It's going to have its nitrogenous base, it's going to have a ribose sugar, and then it's going to have its phosphates. The three phosphate groups are going to be connected to the ribose directly. So we'll have one phosphate attached to the next phosphate, attached to the third phosphate, attached directly to that ribose sugar. These phosphate groups are very bulky, and they have huge negative charges. Recall, a phosphate has a chemical formula, of PO4, with a negative 3 charge. Negative 3 is a pretty big deal. Most ions will never reach the negative 3 ionic state. So by taking three negative 3 ions and connecting them to each other, you can imagine it's going to be a very inherently unstable molecule. It's going to want to fly apart. And this inherent instability of the molecule, or explosive nature of the molecule is one of the things that makes adenosine triphosphate so high energy. It really, really, really wants to get rid of that terminal phosphate group. So when it gets rid of that terminal phosphate group, it's a very energetically favorable reaction. A lot of energy is going to be released. Here we can see a, a MP, adenosine monophosphate, will have just one phosphate group. If we add the second phosphate group, it becomes adenosine diphosphate, ADP. And if we add the third phosphate group, it becomes ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This chemical bond right here between the third and second phosphates is the highest energy chemical bond. Over here between the second and first phosphates, this has less energy, but still is fairly high energy. AMP, adenosine monophosphate, is a low energy molecule. 
adenosine diphosphate is a slightly higher energy molecule and adenosine triphosphate is a very high energy molecule. We use ATP to replenish and regulate our necessary chemical reactions. We, however, need to have a safe supply of ATP in our cells. So we're going to constantly be making more ATP to power the chemical reactions that we use ATP to power and regulate. During ATP hydrolysis, the energy that we release from the ATP is going to power biosynthesis or power anabolic chemical pathways. It's going to activate or phosphorylate individual subunits before they can be linked together and will allow us to make larger molecules during anabolic chemical reactions. Um, we also can use ATP to prep molecules for catabolic chemical reactions. Usually before we start a catabolic metabolic pathway, so before we start breaking down big molecules, we need to use up a little bit of ATP to kickstart the chemical reactions. And you'll see that most catabolic chemical pathways ha require a little bit of energy to be put in at the beginning before the reaction can proceed and lots of energy can be released. You could think of it kind of like the spark that starts a fire. Most matches or most bonfires, most explosions or combustion reactions will not occur all by themselves. We need to input a little bit of energy in the terms of ignition and then once we ignite the chemical reaction then it can proceed all by itself and, get, and that combustion reaction can release the chemical reaction. The same thing is true for catabolic pathways. We need to input just a little bit of energy to get it started and then once it's gotten started it will proceed by itself. When we utilize ATP we'll cleave that terminal phosphate and release energy between the th third and second phosphate group as we make new ATP, we need to input a lot of energy to reconnect a terminal phosphate to that second phosphate group. And our heterotrophs, so organisms that are going to get their carbon from organic sources, these catabolic pathways that break down large macromolecules provide the energy that they need to make ATP out of ADP. This is a big reason why you and I need to eat to replenish our ATP. So, concept check. If we reduce, if we have a redox reaction, the loss of re electrons is going to be known as phosphorylation, oxidation, fermentation, reduction, or none of the choices above is correct. So losing an electron, is that going to be phosphorylation, oxidation, fermentation, or reduction? If you don't know the answer, oh, whew, excuse me, late night. Uh, if you don't know the answer, you can rewind the video, you can check your PowerPoints, or you can check your textbook. One, two, three, four, five. The correct answer is oxidation. The loss of electrons is oxidation. Remember the mnemonic oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So if we lose electrons, it is oxidation. Um, if you have any questions, you can post them in the discussion board or shoot me an email. Happy studies!